continuing our series on worship in the church. Today we're looking at uh, the songs of worship. Um, the songs of worship. Let me open up in a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we ask, Lord, that you would uh, help us, Lord, to understand your word rightly. Uh, help us to understand how you want to be worshipped and and especially now as we um, uh, look at the topic today of the songs, uh, give us wisdom, Lord. You tell us uh, to ask for wisdom, and you give generously without reproach. And so, Lord, we ask for wisdom as we apply your word to specifics of uh, picking songs and singing songs, and uh, especially as a congregation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Kevin DeYoung, one of his articles uh, talking about the songs of worship, he says, when it comes to singing on Sundays, churches have more options than ever before, from hymnals to hillsong uh, to homegrown creations. Pastors and worship leaders have thousands of songs to choose from. It's a nice problem to have, but still a problem. No music leader or pastor can keep up. No church can sing all the great hymns and all the great, the latest greatest songs on the radio. And no musician can excel in all the available styles. And no leader can please all the people all the time. And the proliferation of choices often leads to conflict. Should we do hymns like Wesley Watts or Fanny Crosby? Or should we do contemporary songs like that sound more like 70s folk music? early seeker service contemporary or edgy punk rock songs? Should our music have a Latin flavor or an African-American feel? Should we use chants, choral music, metrical psalms, jazz, country western, or bluegrass? And he says, I can't possibly answer all those questions, but there are some general principles we can use to make wise decisions within our own church music. Uh, and I uh, glean from his article as well as uh, some articles from Bob Coughlin and his book as well, uh, Worship Matters, as well as uh, just in gleaning from, uh, well, before I went into the pastoral ministry, I spent uh, just over two decades in the worship ministry uh, in one form or another. So pulling from that experience... And the learning that I've received from my old pastor, as well as all these other godly men, want to help us to understand what songs do we sing as a church and why. So the first thing to think about and to, and to remember is that the content matters. We're, we're hitting this theme over and over again because this is the main theme when it comes to worship. Uh, remember what worship is, right? Worship is... Uh, declaring the greatness and the goodness of God. And so if that's what worship is, then your understanding of the greatness and the goodness of God, as well as the way that the songs communicate the greatness and goodness of God, will either help increase or decrease or hinder your worship. So if you want to worship God more, uh, know him more, right? Know more about him. That is, read the word, study the word deeply, and then also uh, sing songs that are uh, biblical in their content. So we're kind of answering the, the questions, what advice would you give a worship leader that's looking for songs or a church that's looking for songs? What's the thought process here? Uh, well, again, the content matters. And uh, an old pastor, Frank Griffith, he says, singing is to be an overflow of the word of Christ. This comes from Colossians 3.16. Singing is to be an overflow of the word of Christ. And, and remember, this comes from the very beginning. We looked at this uh, a number of times in this class, and we even looked at this last Sunday as we're walking through uh, the book of Colossians together in our Sunday sermons. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So it, it, the, the, and the result is uh, singing. 
One of the results of the word of Christ is singing. It is the word, again, as I mentioned last week, that is all about Christ. That's what it means when it says the word of Christ. It means that it's the word that is all about Christ. Uh, it's not just his words, but the, all of the word which centers upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. And to dwell in you is to inhabit, to, to live in you. That is scripture is to take up residency in your mind and heart, and, and it is to do that richly, it says. Dwell in you richly, abundantly, greatly, lavishly. Uh, what's, what's interesting here, that word richly uh, is used in a couple other texts. I just want to look at them briefly. Uh, it says in 1 Timothy 6.17, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. The same word as in Colossians 3.16, that the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly. The idea here of richly is the rich and abundant supply of God, right? And then Colossians 3, 5, and 6 says that he saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So richly here in Titus 3 is describing how uh, the manner in which uh, the Father has uh, poured out the Holy Spirit upon his people. And uh, we can say that uh, God did not hold anything back. He wasn't stingy. He wasn't miserly. He wasn't measured in the amount in which he pours out or poured out the Holy Spirit uh, upon and into his people. So it's the same idea, holding nothing back, uh, being abundant, lavish, going above and beyond, right? That's the idea in Colossians 3.16, where it says to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And that word, the, when it says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in English it can come across, you know, like just, just allow it to happen, right? Uh, just let it happen. Um, just, and, and, and it can sound like we're, we're more passive. And that, you know, if I'm just reading the Bible, and uh, then it'll happen to me where... The word of Christ is richly dwelling, but uh, that's just the limitations of English grammar. Uh, when it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, it is a command. It's no different than, um, you know, stop doing this, start doing that. It, it is, you are to be active. Uh, this is a command for you to do and to fulfill. It's not something that you allow to happen to you. You have to pick up your Bible, take up the sword of the Word of God, and actively uh, make this happen, get this going. And it takes discipline day in and day out. Uh, so, if you do that, and if the church is doing that, if the church is letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, the overflow of that will be songs, will be singing. And uh, the primary attention, when we think about what songs do we sing, what songs do we not sing, the primary attention should be given to the lyrics of the songs, the words. Songs must be biblical. Uh, we get this principle from passages like Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4, verse 10 to 12. Let, let me read this for us. Remember the day. Uh, and, and again, this is... Uh, uh, Moses, uh, this is his, you could say, his, uh, his last sermon to the Israelites. He is on the shores, as it were, of the Jordan River. And uh, he is looking on, he's on the wilderness side, you could say, and he's looking across the river, as it were, and he's looking to the promised land. He knows he can't go there, but this next generation will uh, because of the discipline of God. And uh, so he's, he's, in all of Deuteronomy, he, he's not just, uh, you know, reminding them what happened, but he's preaching a sermon based on the history of Israel uh, in, the, in the wilderness. 
and the, their exodus, their rescue out of Egypt. And so he's, he's exhorting them. This is what you need in order to not fail like your parents did. Because remember, this generation, their parents failed morally and uh, spiritually in their devotion to God. And he's imploring them and giving them what they need to be faithful uh, as they leave him behind. So uh, that gives these words uh, some impact here. It says in verse 10, Remember the day you stood before Yahweh your God at Horeb, when Yahweh said to me, Assemble the people to me, that I may cause them to hear my words, so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and dense gloom. And then Yahweh spoke to you from the midst of the fire, and you heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. And uh, what, the reason I, 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 we, we go to this passage is what Moses is convinced that this next generation, that the people of God need as they embark on this journey uh, into the promised land you know, and for the generations to come, what, what they need is to remember what they heard, the words, not the experiences, not the miracles, not this and that, not the sights and the sounds necessarily, but the voice, the words of God. That's what he wants them to go with. And so it's, it's, it, what matters in the Christian life is not experiences, what matters in our encounter, you could say, with God is not experiences and feelings and sights and sounds. It's words. It's truth. It's truth. That's what Moses emphasizes, and that's what we must emphasize as well as the people of God. We see this carry into the New Testament. Acts 2, 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread, to the prayers. So a key devotion to the early church was to the apostles' teaching, was to truth, was to the word of God. That must be our devotion as well. In every aspect of our Sunday services and even your daily life, you must be continually devoting yourself to the word of God. And as you do that, when it comes to the content of the songs that we sing, our songs must be Christ-centered. They must be Christ-centered. As we find new songs to sing as a church, and as, as you listen and enjoy songs, you should be evaluating them by these things. Uh, it should be filled with truth, and it should be Christ-centered as well. It should be Christ-centered. Remember, again, Colossians 3.16, uh, the word of Christ is to dwell within you richly. But not only this, but if we look at the end of time, right? If we, if we look into uh, behind the curtain, as it were, and follow the example of heaven itself, where there is perfect worship, what's interesting when we look at perfect, inspired, sinless worship in heaven the, one of the main themes, if not the main theme, of the song of heaven is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. For example, Revelation 5, 9 and 10. They sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, uh, people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So how do we know that this is a Christ-centered song? How do we know that this is a Christ-centered song? Where do we see Christ here? Yeah, yeah. Purchase, blood, yes. Slain, too, right? 
And then the context, he, he took the scroll, right? The lamb is the one that stood up and took the scroll. So they're singing to Christ about Christ, right? And they're lauding him for his, what he has done and his worthiness. So uh, you could say here, because the one that takes the scroll is, is worthy to take the scroll, right? Worthy are you to take the scroll. So the, the idea is the person, and then all of these things, slain, purchased for God with their blood, that is all talking about his work, right? The person and the work of Christ, who he is, what he's done. And we see this again in Revelation 5, 12, a little bit later on. They were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So again, here's the work that the lamb was slain, Christ was slain, and uh, his worth in his person, all of these attributes are his. These are his, and, the, and, he, and he, re, he receives the worship uh, and the, uh, ad, the acknowledgement that he owns and possesses fully and perfectly these attributes of power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. They're all his and all that we have uh, in these things are his as well. So again, person and work. And then um, verse 13. Every creature, excuse me, every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, notice this, uh, Revelation 5.13. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and the honor, and the glory, and the might, forever and ever. So, here's the Lamb. Who is that? That's Christ. Who's the one who sits on the throne? No. It's the Father. It's the Father. It's the Father. So, to the Father and to the Son. And this follows a pattern of Scripture, right? Philippians 2. We worship Christ, and it redounds to the glory of the Father. Right, so we we see here that the Father and the Son, uh, because some people will say, well, you know, we shouldn't only sing about Jesus, and you know, I, I understand that that you know we need a we need a Trinitarian kind of worship, we need Trinitarian theology, Trinitarian uh, songs, Trinitarian life. Um, we we worship a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the Father focuses upon the Son, uh, and He gets worship in and through the Son. And the Holy Spirit just shines a spotlight upon the Son. So the Son, the Lamb, is the focal point, but not to the, ne the absolute neglect of the Father and the Holy Spirit. But even here, in this, in this phrase, in this song, there is uh, glory given to the Father but not detached from the Son. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, within the same breath, be blessing, honor. And so the idea is equally the Father and the Son, the, 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 the one who sits on the throne and the Lamb, both equally, co-equal in, in their worth uh, to receive blessing, honor, glory, and might forever and ever. See that? So this elevates... And, and, and proves the worthiness and the deity of Christ himself. And then uh, one, one more here. Again, Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with wisdom, uh, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. So again, it's, it's, it's the word of Christ produces the uh, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and the singing. And then the, even the next verse, whatever you do in word or deed, does that include singing songs and picking songs? And Of course it does. So in all, all of these things, uh, whether you're singing or doing the dishes, right? But, but especially here for this class, singing songs, singing worship songs and choosing songs uh, for a church and for your own personal worship, whatever you do. Uh, you need to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he must be the sum and substance of those things. 
So as you, you know, enjoy, you know, there's, there are other Christian songs that we don't sing as a congregation because, as we're going to see, they're just not fitting, but they're not wrong for personal consumption, you could say. You know, there's other songs by solid bands, godly men and women, uh, where we don't sing them for various reasons as a congregation, but by all means you are free and even encouraged to listen to for your own encouragement and edification. But even then, it has to, you ought to use this kind of wisdom. Don't just turn on K-Love and assume that whatever comes on fulfills these requirements and these, these biblical expectations because the majority of them do not. That's the sad reality. Uh, okay. Uh, Bob Coughlin. He says, Bob Coffin with Sovereign Grace uh, Ministry, Sovereign Grace Music. Uh, we use a lot of their uh, content, a lot of their songs. Very reliable uh, ministry for, for Christ-exalting biblical songs. He says, badly played or written music can make great theology sound obscure or unappealing. On the other side, great music can make shallow lyrics sound profound and incredibly moving, right? So there's, that's the power of music itself, right? You can have great content, but if it's not executed well or if it's just a, you know, a bad tune, uh, then it, it, it obscures and makes that song, that glorious truth, unappealing. But on the flip side, great music, and there, there are bands that make great music but have shallow lyrics. But that great music can, in a sense, uh, deceptively um, make the shallow lyrics sound p- profound and moving. So we have to be aware of that. Just because there's some, it, it stirs up some emotion doesn't make it right. Because that, those emotions and, and the, the power of the song and the music itself can, can make you think that the, that the song is more profound, more biblical than it actually is. He goes on, this is why when we're deciding what to sing, we want to give the greatest attention to the lyrics we're singing. Okay, so the... The, the music is so powerful, can make or break a song, no matter what the lyrics, right? So our attention should be to the lyrics and then ho- looking for a song or a tune that matches the lyrics, as we'll, we'll go on to see. So uh, I wanted to put some, put some uh, flesh on this, right? Because we're dealing with kind of abstract principles. What does this look like practically? I'm going to name names. But uh, th- this, is, this is our church, so, you know, uh, we have the freedom to do that. Um, some, some bad examples, first, of lyrics. One by Bethel Music, a song called Gratitude. These are, off of, these are all from the top ten worship songs. So these are, the top, this, these are some of the top ten songs sung in churches, not just on the radio, sung in churches today in America. Okay, all, all three of these. Uh, Gratitude by Bethel Music says, Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, because you've got a line inside those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Uh, this, these lyrics are uh, they're, they're artistic, uh, but they're shallow. They're shallow. Uh, it's, it's pumping yourself up and the emotions, right? It, you're trying to rev up some feeling and some attitude. Uh, and, and this is a section in the song. It's the bridge of the song where it's repeated and repeated and repeated. And the, the, you know, the, the music accompanies it and it gets really intense and it's, it's manipulative. Uh, because the rest of the song, is there isn't much substance to it has just kind of one theme to it, just that we should be thankful. And that's true, but there are other songs that tell us to be thankful better. Um, 
All right, so that's one example. Phil Wickham, um, he has a song, House of the Lord. It's one of the top ten songs sung in, in uh, so-called Christian churches today. He says, we sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. Amen. Absolutely. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Because he hung up on that cross. It's just bad grammar. Uh, but anyways, uh, then he rose up uh, from that grave. And my God, still rolling stones away. Uh, this is a theme that is so prevalent in these kinds of churches and these kinds of uh, movements, especially in the New Apostolic Reformation. It's, it's just dangerous. Uh, this kind of language of making a way, uh, rolling stones away. Um, this is really big right now in Christian music, where it's, you know, it's talking about some sort of breakthrough. And uh, this connects to the teaching in these songs, or excuse me, the teaching in these churches, where they, the main theme is, what breakthrough does God have in store for you in your life? And most often, it's some health breakthrough, some relational breakthrough, some financial breakthrough, or anything else like that. Just some, something's not going right in your life. And uh, apparently, in their theology, everything should go right in the Christian life. And, uh, you know, trials and tribulations and difficulties of life uh, are just in the way. And God's job is to get those out of the way, but that's not biblical. God is the one who, uh, and we see in Psalms, God is the one who, who uh, places you in the waves of, of trials. He's the one that causes those. And so he, it's not his job to take them away. He's, it's his, it is his sovereign plan to place those in your life and to teach you something in those things. Right, So this is treating God like, well, I'm just having a hard time today, God. That's not how it's supposed to go, so I need you to show up for me and make life easier in some way. See? It's, it's a twisting of our understanding of God. And then Hillsong, what a beautiful name. Um, the first line is just the bane of my existence. You didn't want heaven without us. And then it goes on. So, Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? I mean, the, the, the last uh, two lines are, are true and right. The, the second line, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. There's some truth in that. It's, it's ambiguous. Um, but then that first line is clearly, it's just clearly not helpful. And it's a skewed understanding of the purpose of your salvation. Uh, God was just fine without us. And he, we shouldn't be singing songs that, that have this air of, you're welcome, God, for believing in you. Right? It should be the gratitude on our part for the new heart and the new life and the sight of the glory of God and his forgiveness and adoption. Not, you know, I was so, I mean, it just comes off arrogant. That there's something so good about us that he was missing. That heaven was missing something without me. That's just, uh, well, it's, 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 it's blasphemous, if not darn near blasphemous. So these are some not so good songs. And what's sad is all the three of these songs are three of the most sung songs today in Christian churches. That is what's so disappointing about this. I didn't have to dig for these. We, I just went to you know the the, the site where you know you're, you're you know where where they record this stuff, and right there on the first page, it's the, these are it. You want to be contemporary. You want to you want to engage this generation. These are the songs you sing. And that's just so disappointing, so sad. A couple songs that I hope we can see a contrast. 
uh, one, and these are two songs that we're singing this morning as a church in the next hour. How Great Thou Art by Stuart Wesley. It says, when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. And there's just so much rich truth in this, that he did not withhold his son. That's, there's, that's biblical. Sent him to die, that's biblical. Uh, and, and just the wonder of it, I can't take the gospel. It, it's just so great of a gospel, so marvelous, I can't fully take it in. But he continues that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing. The fact that he would not only bear my burden of sin, but gladly bear it. That he did not resist. That he did not, uh, was not forced into this begrudgingly. But uh, even as we see in the gospel account, that as they were on that last journey to Jerusalem, uh, that last trek to the place where where he would have his, his last weeks of, uh, leading up to and including the Passover where he would die on the cross. It says in the gospel accounts that he outpaced. as He, he, he was on ahead of the rest of the disciples. And they were, it was just troubling to them. He, he was, it, it, the idea is he was in a rush to get to there. That's our Savior. He ran to the cross. And then he goes on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the song, My Redeemer's Love, my song, Grace Music. My Redeemer's Love is deeper <clears throat> than the deep depths of sin and hell. He who was enthroned in glory came to bring us to himself. Now, there's a, there's a theme of, well, it, it, it's what that other hill song is trying to say, but it's, it's not being unbiblical, right? It's not that he needed heaven to or he needed us to make heaven complete but but he did come to bring us to himself but we understand that 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 him bringing us to himself is the most fulfilling thing for us and the most glorifying thing for him it's not about us it's about him he brought us to him and it goes on my redeemer's love is wider Right, so I mean, the, the the theme is my redeemer's love is deeper, right? And then my deep my redeemer's love is wider than the breach my sins had made. It, this is this is reflecting on uh, Ephesians, where it talks about to, to to dwell upon, think upon the the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of the love of God in Christ for us, right? That, that's what they're doing in this song. It's wider than the breach my sins had made. And he reached down into my darkness. He alone has power to save. And, and that's just, these are just a, a, a few uh, examples from even the songs that we'll sing this morning as a congregation. So I, I just encourage you to enjoy and appreciate the truth that we sing each Sunday. Much thought is given into it. Much prayer, much intent. And uh, we have been... Um, we have, it is our intent to be more and more selective in the songs that we do and do not sing. You, you, I'm sure you, you can tell that in what we do sing now and what we don't. Uh, and uh, the goal is to always be getting better and to be in a constant state of refinement and reformation, as it were, as a church. All right. I got to keep going. Number two, the tune matters. The tune matters. So we're answering here the question, what factors go into determining appropriate musical styles in worship? Now again, I just a quick review of Colossians 3.16 from the sermon last week. Uh, the, 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 the style or the manner is, is um, and the songs are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, right? Those are what we're supposed to sing. Now, 
Psalms, again, are usually speaking of an Old Testament psalm. This is how the word is used. For example, in Luke 20, David himself says in the book of Psalms, the same Greek word as our passage in Colossians 3.16. And he goes on to quote a psalm of David. Uh, And then hymns. Hymns are historically uh, royal or triumphant songs about kings or heroes or deities. So they're, they're royal or triumphant in their tone and style. They're more celebratory and, and, and appropriate of a, it, it, their songs and styles worthy of a king. Uh, and the idea of a king returning from battle victoriously. Uh, what kind of anthem maybe is a good word for that? What kind of anthem would be sung? It, it wouldn't be a soft, light thing. It would be something uh, loud and and. and you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, words, words fail me at this moment, but uh, loud and triumphant, okay? Uh, I, I would argue, and uh, not just me, but other, other theologians would argue. Um, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, uh, give us a good example of a hymn. In Colossians 1, 15 to 20, we see uh, verse 15 and 16 here. This is the first verse who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So that's his person, right? It's more of his person, a little bit of his work of creation, but it it, it is a a global, uh, universal, cosmic kind of reign and supremacy, right? This is, this is a hymn that's all about the supremacy of Christ. And one way he is supreme is he is a firstborn of all creation. Right? This, is, this is the theme, the, the creation. Of for, in him all things were created. And then again, created through him and for him. So that's, that's the emphasis. Is he is the creator and uh, in, in the midst of all creation he stands above as firstborn. Right? Not as a created being but uh, having that rank and roll over all of creation. And then if we jump over, if this is the first verse, I would argue the parallel is, is the second verse uh, in 18, 19, and 20, where it says, who is the beginning? And, and you can see here, who is the beginning? And then that is parallel to verse 15, who is the image? That's why I would argue it's the... It's the uh, Second verse, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself. So it's focusing on uh, his death, burial, and resurrection, right? Being raised from the dead, reconciling all things to himself. And verse 20 goes on to uh, talk about his work of reconciliation. So... His supremacy in his work of creation, his supremacy in the work of redemption, you could say, verse 2. And then verse 17 and 18 is the chorus. This this is just beautiful. Uh, It says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. Now, notice, and this is just amazing. Uh, he is before all things. This leads. This is connecting to uh, him, his sovereignty over all of creation. If you can understand my writing, uh, he is before all, th- and that's connecting to his sovereignty over creation. All things created is the idea, and and then this last line: he is the head of the body, of the church. That is connecting down to what follows in his sovereignty over. Uh, sovereign uh, supremacy in the work of redemption. Right? And then, this is where it gets just awesome. Then you have this middle line. In him, all things hold together. And not only in the person of Christ, but even in this lyric of the song, this central lyric of the song holds together it's the hinge, it's, it's the connecting point between his supremacy over creation 
and his supremacy over redemption, in the work of redemption. So this, this lyric holds both halves of the song together. And even in, in, in what it's saying is, well, that's really Christ. He is the focal point. He is the hinge of all things. The first creation and you could say the second creation of which the church is a... Uh, the first work, the first fruits of this new creation. We're, we're the first fruits of the new heavens and the new earth. Did you know that? And uh, so the first creation and, and then the second creation, in a sense, beginning with the redemption, it's all held together. And, and the whole story of history in, in, in from Genesis to where the way that Revelation ends and it ushers us into this new era, this new eternity, this new world at the end of Revelation, it, he holds both together in his person and work. Oh, that's just, it's glorious. And, and of course, leave it to, to God to write the best song, right? To write a song that's as rich as this. And that uh, is just so well-crafted as this. This is a hymn, right? And it's, again, it celebrates his supremacy and, and how he and his accomplishment of creation and redemption. So you see, it, it, it's a triumphal, kingly, royal uh, song. That's a hymn. Okay, spiritual song. A spiritual song is uh, just basically... Uh, a spiritual song as opposed to a secular song, right? Songs uh, that are spiritual, uh, songs that are not just all about, uh, well, causing a breakthrough and getting what you want out of life, right? As many of these songs do. It's not, talk, it's not just concern about God moving obstacles out of your way it, it's it's their spiritual songs they deal with the soul matters of your heart and uh, this is this word is used uh, in for example revelation 15 3 they sang the song of moses that's the word song in our passage all right um just some some more details when we choose songs, um, we need to choose songs that people want to sing. Choose songs that people want to sing. And this is because worship is meant to be pleasant primarily for the truth within it, but it can be musically pleasant as well. And, it, and I would argue it should be musically pleasant as well. Right? There should be a delight and, and, a, and a goodness about the content of the song but that doesn't mean that we don't have to seek for uh, tunes and styles that match that uh, delight and goodness and aesthetic of the lyrics as well. We got this principle from uh, Psalm 135, verse 3. Praise Yahweh, for Yahweh is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is lovely. So the, the singing of praises is to be a lovely thing, a delightful thing, a beautiful thing. There should be an aesthetic uh, appeal to our singing. Um, Psalm 147, verse 1, Praise Yahweh, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant, and praise is becoming. Right? Not only is praise becoming as in it's fitting to just being the people of God, but it's, it's pleasant. And so if, if, if singing is to be pleasant, well then, then, then shouldn't we sing pleasant songs? Right? Good songs. Not just, you know, dirges or funeral songs, but well-written songs with good melodies and, and so on. Uh, a, a great lyric, a great lyric can go unheard for decades, if not centuries, because it was wedded to a poor melody. Uh, for example, John Newton's song, Amazing Grace was around for decades before it started getting traction, only when it was set to an American tune. Did you know that? 
So it, it was a great song, great lyrics of Amazing Grace, but it just didn't get any traction. It wasn't whatever music it had at the beginning there uh, wasn't good. And so nobody wanted to sing it. But as soon as it was wedded to a good tune of Amazing Grace, then, man, it just caught on. They, they found a tune that matched the lyrics, and, and it was a delight for the people of God to sing. Uh, also, is, um, is musical style or genre amoral? That is, does it matter? Is there a you know, righteous or holy and, and then a sinful genre of music, right? Is classical music, you know, the music of heaven and jazz is the music of hell? Or rock and roll is, you know, what's on the PA system in Hades, right? Some people think that. Um, the, the reality is all musical styles today that we know that have ever been in existence are the product of sinful men, right? And so we just need to be honest about that. Across the board, they all are stained with sin, okay? There's... There, there, there's we just have to admit that. And so uh, music, so classical music or anything like that, Bach, is not of God, right? There's beauty there, but it's not, it doesn't have some righteous, holy quality to it in and of itself. Uh, some things to consider about this, uh, as, 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 and things that we consider uh, as a church, uh, is uh, asking the questions, is the melody singable to the congregation? So we don't, we don't sing songs that are just so complex in the tune that nobody can get it, right? Um, but the, the goal is to increase the ability of the congregation to get better at singing more and more complex songs to, uh, to a limit that's governed by reason and wisdom. Another question to think about is, is the style of the song conducive to congregational worship? Right? Uh, especially 1 Corinthians 14, everything done in order. Will the style of music cause disorder? Well, then we must not do it. Does it, does it encourage order and everybody's able to sing along together? Then, then it's, it could be a helpful tune. And then a third question, does a style or feel of the music fit the theme of the words? Right. So, uh, you know, singing about trials or a, con a song about confession of sin uh, shouldn't be connected to a trite or upbeat tune. It just doesn't fit. Right. Uh, so we need to think about those things. Um, another aspect of this is that the tune and the melody of the song ought to serve the lyrics itself. Uh, this means that the lyrics should be memorable as a result of the melody. The lyrics should be memorable as a result of the melody. Um, uh, I've heard a, a man say, I want to choose songs that um, uh, an elderly person or, or, or an injured, severely injured person, I, I want to choose songs that somebody, uh, that one of the congregation can sing and remember on their deathbed. I want to bring them a song that they can remember and the words and the tune are both memorable enough and impactful enough and meaningful enough that will hold, hold their spirits, right? And will set their minds upon Christ and the hope of heaven, even there on their deathbed, right? And those are the, that's the aim. Uh, so, no jazz fusion songs. <laughs> No incredibly complex Bach songs where we're singing all these crazy melodies. Those might be nice for a special number or something like that, but it's just not conducive. And, and that's fine, you know, if you find a song that, that is super complex and very musical, uh, and, but that's, that's fine for, for yourself to enjoy and be edified by on your own. Uh, one thing to think about this from Bob Coffin again, is I, he says, I find it fascinating that God gave us a songbook. God did give us a songbook. It's called the Psalms. 
with numerous, numerical, numerous musical references, right? Like Selah, for example. That's a musical cue. But no actual music, right? No notes. No sheet music, you know, between the lines of, of, of the book of Psalms. And that should tell us something, that uh, God doesn't intend for there just to be one kind of music sung by, you know, the saints in San Jose as well as the saints in uh, Zimbabwe or something, right? Um, Our songs ought to correspond to the way in which Scripture communicates truth. So Scripture presents truth to us beautifully, aesthetically, even in that hymn that we looked at in Colossians 1, there's a beauty to it, there's a form to it. Uh, it's aesthetic, it's beautiful, and, and even especially when we get into the Psalms, truths, profound truths presented in very beautiful, picturesque, uh, glorious ways. And so our presentation of truth today in church must reflect that same beauty and aesthetic. Um, it shouldn't just be plain and stripped down. I think that's an overreaction uh, to, you know, the other option of, you know, concerts and performances. Also, the kinds of expressions, that is the words, the phrases, the attitudes, the kinds of expressions, uh, the, 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 the kinds of songs that we sing should um, um, match uh, the, the, those things in Scripture. So the words, phrases, and attitudes and tones that we find in Scripture um, should be reflected in our songs, and our songs should not reflect things that are unfitting in Scripture. For example, aggressive or angry songs is not appropriate for the singing of praises to God. Uh, especially for congregational worship. Sensual songs. There are some Christian songs out there that are sensual in their sound. Uh, they sound like a sensual love song. That's just not appropriate for the way that we address our God. Or silly or flippant songs. Songs that come across as, you know, they're trying to be cel uh, celebratory or joyful but it comes up, it's not executed well, and it sounds flippant and almost silly or too light. Uh, we should uh, look out for those and, and avoid those kinds of songs. Uh, I need to go on, because there's one thing uh, I, I want to address in this last point. The last point is the church matters, and this is really where a lot of the question is um, in the, I want to make just one point here. The church matters. What do I mean by this? When we, when we select songs, we think about the saints, the believers, the Christians that are the church. We think about you, brothers and sisters, when we pick songs. One specific way is that there should be wisdom exercised in choosing the sources of our songs, the sources of our songs. Who, what, what, um, what website, what bucket do we go to to get to draw these songs? What well do we go to to draw our songs from? Do we go to the, that website and, and look at the top 10 uh, songs that are sung in America and say, well, that's the song, those are the songs we sing, right? Is that what we do? No. Wisdom should be uh, exercised in choosing songs. And I would say even for you too, Christian, exercise discernment in who you listen to. Uh, when we sing a certain song by a certain band or ministry, what we do and what you do is you open the door to their brand. This was put really well. I think that's a good way to put it at, uh, I, that we heard in, at our last uh, uh, worship conference just last week. When you introduce songs by Bethel, 
or Hillsong or Elevation Music or anything else kind of along in, in those circles. When we choose songs by those bands or quote unquote ministries, we open the church up to their brand. And I think that's an important way, and I think that's a way to communicate it that we get today, right? Think of the brand of Nike, right? How do you get introduced? Well, if you like sports, you start seeing, oh, the clothes that they wear, the shoes that they wear, that's Nike. So you buy their shoe, and then you become a member of uh, Nike.com, right? And then they start uh, producing content, and you'll watch that content. And in our age, just the reality of our age, the algorithm, right? We, we all know the algorithm that is out there uh, of YouTube or whatever other uh, source of content that you consume. Those algorithms say, oh, you like Nike? Here's some more Nike, right? So it is with these ministries. They say, oh, you like this Bethel song? You look that up. Or I heard you talk about it, right, as I, as I was snooping on you through your phone. Um, okay, well, here's some more Bethel music. Oh, here's a Bethel, uh, here's some more Bethel content, uh, whether it's a sermon or a conference or a post or an inspirational phrase or something like that. Those things start to come your way, right? And we understand that that's, that happens, um, and we are, it is our responsibility to guard the people of God from that content. Because though there may be a good song, and they, they do have good songs that are not heretical. So do we say, well, let's just sing as long as we sing those ones that are biblical and Christ-centered and they're, they're great tunes. Can we sing those? Uh, well, for us in this church, we do not. Because it opens the church up and you to their brand. What the, what, and it's intentional by them. They produce this great music in order to fall. And behind that cart is the rest of their content. We are exposed, and you may not know this, but there is a market-driven business-oriented and algorithm-laden worship music industry today. It is an industry. And uh, it's naivety to, to, to think otherwise. That mu- worship music industry is driven by the market. It is business-oriented. Not spirit, not, they're not, it's not thinking about what's best for your soul. Or, and it's not thinking about um, you know, being uncompromising on truth. They're not thinking that. They're thinking what is going to get the most clicks, the most hits, the most likes, the most plays, and what is going to just be the hook to get more people in to their churches and consuming their content and their product. And those churches preach a false, a false gospel. That's why it's so dangerous. Bethel, Hillsong, Elevation. I'll say it. I don't care. Be mad at me. Uh, They preach a false gospel, and Scripture is clear about what to do with that. A few verses, and we'll close. 2 Corinthians 11, 3. I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Pastorally, this is what I am concerned about. Deception. I don't want you to be deceived, and I, I want to stay as far away as that possibility as possible. 1 Corinthians 5.11 But now I am writing to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is sexually immoral person or greedy or an idolater or a viler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. And the sad truth is that many of these so-called pastors of these ministries and these churches uh, are more qualified for this list than they are the list for qualifications of an elder in 1 Timothy 3. We are not to associate with those men. 
Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.14, if anyone does not obey our word in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. So have no association with those people and those ministries that uh, are not devoted to obedience to the word of God, who compromise, in other words. And then... uh, One last one, Galatians 1, I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really another, right? And that's the reality. If it's a different gospel, it's not really a gospel. It's not really good news. There's nothing good about that. Uh, Yeah, it's bad news. Uh, Only there are some who are deserving you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That's what's happening. They're not, you know, going out and saying, you know, just reject Christ. They're just distorting the gospel just a bit. They're making it man-centered instead of God-centered. They're they're treating God like a genie instead of your creator and ruler. And he goes on, but even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel... um, we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. So I don't care if it comes from an apostle, an angel, Bethel, Hillsong, or Elevation, or any other. If, I don't care how good the tune is. If it's contrary to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, get as far away from it as you can. And so this, this holds, this holds uh, sway in our corporate worship We are very selective, and this Christian needs to hold sway in your own private consumption of Christian music. Be wary of those. They might come on, Caleb, I would just encourage you. You probably would do better just to not listen to Caleb. Yeah, a question or a thought? Yeah. Feel good for the soul, you know, so to speak. Yeah. So the question is, what about the private consumption of music, like hip hop, where the 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 words are sound, biblical, solid? Are those still appropriate for your private consumption? I would say absolutely. Uh, if you, uh, I, I've I've uh, heard Shai Lin say himself that he was very intentional with the kind of because there's. Different styles of rap music, right? Shailin is a, a, a Christian uh, pastor, godly man, and he produces, you know, really good uh, rap music uh, that's Christian content. Uh, he, he said he was very intentional about what style of rap music he would play. He didn't do, you know, I, I don't want to even get into it, but he didn't do certain styles of rap music. He, he chose his style because it was more conducive to communicating truth. And it wasn't aggressive. It was, it, it was more, there was, there's a niche within rap music that is more, um, even secularly, uh, it's more heady and it's more, um, you know, they try and be profound with their lyrics and thoughtful in what they're trying to communicate. There's a genre of that within rap music. He said, that's what I chose because I'm trying to communicate truth clearly and be thought-provoking to my audience. And so, yes, uh, it can be, but with that kind of wisdom, I would say, with that kind of wisdom, what, what, is, what is it doing to my emotions and feelings? Because music does have that power to manipulate, right? And so just be wary of that. Is it manipulating me? Am I thinking the song is better than it is because it's just a really great, I like the beat or I like the sound, I like the song, I like the tune? Uh, or, or is it in and of itself, I just read the lyrics, is it good enough? Uh, and, and then does the, does the song match what it's trying to communicate? Great question. Any other questions as we close? Yes. Oh. Also, like, people can, is that helpful for the music? Yeah, very good. I totally spaced on that. Thank you, dear. Um, 
We are, if you're on Spotify, um, and you can be on Spotify for free, which is nice, uh, to listen to music. Uh, look up Redeemer Bible Church, and you'll see our little logo, and we have a playlist of the songs that we sing congregationally. We try and keep that updated. There might be some hangover from uh, other eras <laughs> of song choice, uh, but uh, we try and keep that updated with sound biblical songs, songs that we sing as a congregation, and we try and put our, in our new songs in there as well as we update. Uh, and it's, it's safe, we'll put it that way. It's a safe kind of playlist that you can just put on shuffle and repeat and just enjoy and not be worried, am I singing heresy or am I exposing myself to uh, some unhelpful ministry? All right, And, and even the, the artists and, and, and the labels that are there on that playlist, that, that can be a helpful kind of launching point into other bands and albums that you might listen to as well. All right, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you'll help us to wisely apply this as a congregation and then especially even as individual believers help us to be careful to what we listen to uh, and to be thoughtful in every area and aspect of our daily life. Help us to be shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.